I think you can see my uh, presentation slide. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, I I just started recording and I Facebook live right now. So we'll start in thirty seconds. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning and welcome to Gopio International Health Council, Gopio Central Jersey and Indus TV's webinar on the role of food supplements played to build resistance against COVID-19. My name is Dr. Tushar Patel. I am the chairman of Gopio Health Council. I'd like to thank you all for joining this webinar today. I would like to extend my sincere appreciation to Gopio International Chairman Dr. Thomas Abraham and other international members Dr. Rajiv Mehta and Dr. And Dinesh Mittal for the leadership and guidance uh, throughout the years for Gopio's activities. Gopio Central Jersey Executive Team Kunal Mehta, Kunal Gupta, Amit Kucharya, Neil Mehta, Suresh Reddy and special thanks to Vijay Garg of PGA and Indus TV who collaborated with us today for this webinar. Special thanks to Dr. A Asha Ramesh and Dr. Majid for Sabinsa, from Sabinsa, Sabinsa Corporation for this wonderful collaboration for our audience. At this time, I would like to invite Dr. Thomas Abraham, Chairman of Gopio International, to say a few words before I introduce our guest speaker today. Dr. Abraham, please. Thomas. Thomas, go ahead. Thomas? Thomas, can you hear us? Thomas? We can't hear you, Thomas. Go ahead, Thomas. We can't hear you. Thomas, we cannot hear you. Uh, so sorry, uh, Thomas, we uh, cannot hear you. Looks like your audio is not working somehow. Uh, anyway, we're going to continue with the program. Uh, so uh, for the last few years, Gopio Health Council is organizing health summits in New York and New Jersey. 
and for the last two years it, it has become very popular and interest to so many people who attended where we had discussion of medical mental and oral health alternative medicine yoga meditation nutrition supplements and topics of living healthier lifestyle and improve overall well-being since we all are following social distancing during this time of public health crisis and COVID-19 pandemic, Gopio is having many sessions virtually via webinars. Today, we are having such a webinar virtually and broadcasted via Facebook Live. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Anurag Pandey with us, who will give us some useful information and discuss the role of food supplements to build resistance against the virus I know there are a lot of talks and advices from people on social media on what vitamins or supplements to take to boost the immunity, but let's hear from the expert. So before uh, I invite Dr. Pandey, let me give you a brief introduction of Dr. Pandey. Dr. Pandey has been with Sabinsa's sister company, Samai Lab, since 2004 as a researcher and spent several years at Sabinsa's Japan Tokyo office as senior technical manager. Currently, Dr. Pandey works from Sabinsa Corporation's headquarter in East Windsor, New Jersey in the USA. He holds a PhD in phytochemistry and has authored several trade and peer reviewed publications. Dr. Pandey has been applying his chemistry knowledge to the ingredients of Sabinsa products to bring a refreshing viewpoint of understanding how these ingredients work. Sabinsa is the source for nutraceutical industry for assured quality of standardized botanical extracts and phytonutrients and is recognized as the standard bearer of the industry for decades. So without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Anurag Pandey to this live webinar. Thank you, Dr. Tushar. And uh, hello, everyone. I hope you can uh, see my screen. Uh, yes. You can see the my slides. So let me say that we all carry the same feeling towards what exactly is happening, you know, in the world today. I was just thinking uh, about giving this webinar virtually, and it's, it's, it's quite irony that just before this pandemic hit us, with all this technology in our hand, this iPhones and tablets, our person-to-person -person interaction was actually getting quite less and less over the time. Our friends meet on the phone, and Skype more than in person. But now when suddenly the social distancing has become a reality for us, each of us feels suffocated. and We want to just come out of it. I think I feel the same way as, and I'm sure you feel the same way too, because it's the human nature to connect and live in a community. You don't feel empathy for someone uh, on these devices, but when you see them really, uh, in, in real life uh, in suffering, it hits you. Many of us may not have seen or been close to our relatives or parents as much as we would have, uh, but today we can realize the value of our time and how much these human relationship means to us. So let's hope that this technology takes us through for the next hour or so without any hiccups. Uh, let me first introduce myself and my company. Uh, my name is Anurag Pandey. I work as Vice President of Scientific and Regulatory Affairs at Sabinsa Corporation's New Jersey headquarters, which is located in East Windsor. Uh, Sabinsa Corporation has been serving the natural product industry for over 32 years now. And today we can proudly say that we are not only brought the Indian medicinal system of Ayurveda to the Western world, but we also contributed to advancing that science to meet the consumer needs for today as per their life cycle, lifestyle. When Dr. Majid envisioned Sabinsa Corporation three, de three decades back, Ayurveda was more of, I would say, a uh, folklore in this country. But with his uh, pharmaceutical background, he set his foot in the US and obtained PhD from St. John's University, worked at Pfizer and Carter Wellness, and then set out on the goal to bring the Eastern uh, uh, medicine to the West. And thus, Sabinsa was born in 1988. Innovation for us never stopped, and so we continue today. Today, uh, in this online seminar, we'll be discussing the role of food supplements 
in building the resistance towards the COVID-19. We'll be talking more on the antiviral activity of uh, phytonutrients and, and importance of how these herbs, which are very common to Indian culture, can help to reduce and prevent uh, such occurrences. It's really sad to see when these numbers keep climbing every day. And how often we just wonder when these numbers stops climbing not. And to give you an idea, these numbers are not just mathematical numbers. They are people who are part of our society and were perhaps among one of us. I would at this point like to uh, give a shout out to our first responders, the doctors, the nurses, medical staff, who are our frontline soldiers at this very difficult time. Hopefully when we finish this presentation and go back home and check the daily status of situation, we may get a better news and perhaps the curve starts going south to help us recover from this pandemic. It's actually no, uh, no surprise that today, no part of the world has been untouched by this virus, either by community transmission or migration of people or cluster. However, we definitely know that it has affected humanity respective of its genetic makeup, ethnicity, color, creed, sex, or religion. Now to start with COVID-19, or as prior known as coronavirus, belongs to family coronavirity. It was first observed in somewhere in 1930s in chicken. But the human coronavirus came in picture only 1960s, when it was isolated in UK as the same time as in US. It was actually isolated first time from a child who was suffering from a common cold. Now till date, there are six species of coronavirus which have been isolated and they can cause symptoms which can vary from mild to severe. Uh, it came in early uh, part of, in the news in early part of 2003, when it was found in the acute respiratory syndrome, which I think could, it took almost 8,000 lives at that, that point of time globally. And back in, nine, in 2012 also, there was a new type of coronavirus was found, which was later known as Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome or MERS. However, between different coronavirus uh, epidemics, there is a difference. The difference was in the transmission level, the mode of transmission, the R0 value, which indicates its virulence in infecting people. However, all these viruses were still found to have human to human transmission. Now, this recent outbreak in 2019, which happened in Wuhan, China, was suspected to have transmitted from bat to human. Now, one may like to say, how come bat came in this picture? Bat actually as is a mammal and is a reservoir for coronavirus. A lot of studies have been on coronavirus being done uh, while they were uh, infecting the uh, bats. Now, there are certain challenges which we face uh, while treating or managing this coronavirus symptoms. First of all, it has a very high transmission rate, which means each person carrying this virus, irrespective of the uh, symptoms, has a potential to infect two to 2.5 people. Secondly, it's mode of transmission, which took some time actually to understand uh, properly, uh, it was understood now that uh, it can be uh, it can be spread and transmitted by nasal discharge, coughs, knees, mucus. Those are the major pathways. We later see even in the studies how long it can survive on a particular surface because there is a human to human transmission, and there is a lot of uh, objects being uh, communicated between people. But the major risk factor was still. Uh, is transmission. While the previous viruses uh, or epidemics had a high mortality, but the person to person transmission was a bit limited. Population at risk are the people who belong to a certain age group where the body's immune response is not as agile as we would like to have. People with immunocompromised health are also in the risk category. 
and as well as people with underlying health also have shown differential effect towards this virus. Now, when it comes to the underlying health conditions, I just took a snapshot of fatalities in New Jersey. It is uh, it's a response from three days back. And as you can see, people suffering from cardiovascular diseases show higher fatality rate when exposed to COVID-19. Similarly, people suffering from diabetes also show high vulnerability towards this viral infection. These data uh, basically shows vulnerability between uh, uh, among each group suffering from underlying health condition. So people who are, <laughs> who people who are, uh, who are coming into the hospital out of uh, 100 uh, patients of cardiovascular diseases, only 59% have shown uh, fatality. So this indicates how these underlying metabolic uh, uh, activities do affect uh, how badly coronavirus has infected. Now, when let's look into the mechanism of its exposure. So basically, this virus binds to the host re receptor cell. Uh, in case of this coronavirus, it actually occurs on the through the angiotensin converting enzyme, what we call as ACE2 receptor. So each virus, when it has to enter the cell, it actually goes through a receptor. This receptor is well known uh, for, uh, for being a target uh, receptor for hypertensive uh, medication. Now this virus, once it enters, or genome enters the cell cytoplasm, it fuses with the cellular membrane. And then it releases its genetic material into the cell's nucleus or cytoplasm, replicates, assembles new virons or the viral molecules, and they are released from the cell surface by exocytosis. So basically it's killing the cell. And because of the release of this viral uh, molecules, now the immune system will start kicking in. Now once the virus enters, the body of the host, it causes basically two types of immune responses. So the initial stage of incubation, which is a non-severe stage where you feel slight uh, 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 fever, you have some symptoms uh, developing, there is a specific adaptive immune system which kicks in. And the subjects which are in general good health will elicit the specific antiviral uh, immunity and perhaps they will overcome uh, with some uh, with some uh, effect on from their uh, you know uh, uh, from daily life side maintaining good health uh, social distancing recovery is much faster however we do see this response may be different for people in different uh, age as well as genetic differences however if successful the immune system may manage to overcome the viral takeover of the essential organs. And such people, as I mentioned, may show no or very mild symptoms. And 80% of people who actually contract this virus do show a similarity to this uh, situation. But 20% of people who contract this virus may have to visit the hospital. Uh, rest may be asymptomatic, but here the symptoms are much more strong. And that is the time when the innate response kicks in. If the initial response is not strong enough to overcome the, uh, the virus infection, then the protective immune system may not be able to stop the virus replicating and it moves into other tissues. This may cause later innate response from the damaged cells in the organs like lungs, which are predominantly more affected, and it may cause the life-threatening disorder. This is what we call as cytokine storm syndrome. Now, cytokine storm syndrome is important to understand. Why? Because it's, it's a form of uh, systemic inflammation when large number of white blood cells, which are actually part of your immune uh, system, are activated and they release inflammatory cytokines, which are inflammatory molecules, which in turn activates even more a white blood cell. So in one way, it is basically creating a chain reaction in your body and becomes important and necessary 
to block this overreactive inflammation before it starts destroying its own cells. So in some way, your own immune system starts working against you. So pro-inflammatory molecules, especially when we look into interleukin-6, it's a kind of a pro-inflammatory molecule. Uh, it can targeting this pro-inflammatory molecule can actually be a beneficial target for management of inflammation in general, as well as in uh, prevention, as we will see in the later stage. So these pro-inflammatory um, uh, uh, molecules, this IL-6, are now considered to be a target, uh, uh, a therapeutic target for the COVID-19 to manage this aggressive inflammatory response, which also breaks the cytokine storms in the tissue. So from here onwards, when we'll be talking to uh, talking about these herbs in general, we'll be actually looking specifically towards the their activity of inhibiting or anti-interleukin-6 activity, or what we'll call as IL-6 activity. So we'll see in all these herbs which we'll be talking now, what kind of uh, uh, effect these herbs may have on the IL-6 activity, which is important to stop the cytokine storm uh, syndrome. Now we have seen that uh, cytokine uh, uh, interleukin inhibition can actually help uh, uh, the COVID-19 patients. This study was actually published uh, very recently in Lancet. Uh, in, in one way, we have understood that IL-6 inhibition can actually help not only uh, people suffering from the viral infection, but also can be supportive as a preventive medication. So the idea is basically to target the stage of viral infection and slow down body's overreactive system from producing more pro-inflammatory molecules. In other words, to break the storm. Now, as the, study, as the studies have shown that people suffering from COVID-19 uh, show the telltale signs of immune system going to the cytokine uh, storm level, it's prudent to look at reducing this propagation of uh, hyperactive immune system. So now let's look at some of the herbs which we have been using in our supplements. Perhaps you may be using some of them in your kitchen uh, for a variety of health benefits. But today we'll look more specifically for their action towards IL-6. And we'll also see how they actually have been helpful in initial or preliminary studies on these viral infections. So let's look at the first and most well-known herb, uh, which is not only in your kitchen, but also actually in US supplement or dietary supplement industry. That is the turmeric. Turmeric uh, provides this yellow colored compound called curcumin. Turmeric at home is used as spice and perhaps as preservative. However, apart from its used in the culinary delicacies, the major interest in this plant has been related to this yellow colored components, which are called collectively known as curcuminoids, with the curcumin as main compound. And this compound has been studied over decades to show its health benefits existing over a variety of chronic health conditions. Long time back, it was used more for the joint health, but now our studies have shown that it has been very helpful very uh, therapeutically active for people suffering from high lipid level or people suffering from cognitive health, anxiety, depressive disorders, peptic ulcers, even it also affects your microbiome, which is also a very important part of your health. And in fact, the microbiome decides uh, your health or your uh, susceptibility towards chronic health conditions. It's also important uh, turmeric is also well known in managing healthy immune health in addition to its use in cancer studies for the benefit as an adjuvant. So one of the reasons why curcumin can be a game changer in protecting against the current health concerns is because of its IL-6 inhibitory activity, which can help to control this cytokine storm, which is again a critical event in 
in, in the progression of this viral infections in the lung. Now, it is important to understand that turmeric compounds directly beneficial to enhance the immunity by preventing the production of inflammatory cytokine proteins. And at the same time, they stimulate the natural killer cells, which are also crucial to innate immunity. So curcumin just, just does not inhibit the interleukin-6 and prevents the pro-inflammatory uh, effect. But at the same time, it also stimulates your immune system to fight against the, uh, the pathogens. Now, apart from the interleukin-6 inhibitory activity, or what we call as IL-6 inhibitory activity, curcumin has also shown other pathways that can help to reduce the viral infectivity, especially when it comes to case of enveloped viruses. The study mentioned on this slide was carried out on influenza virus. Uh, most of the viruses have a protein envelope. Uh, think it as a protective layer, which they have while, uh, uh, while transferring from uh, one cell to another. It, it also actually helps for them, this uh, envelope, uh, which is actually derived from uh, partly from the host cell, it actually helps the viruses to avoid the immune system. Uh, so they can go unrecognized from cell to cell without actually kicking in the immune uh, function. So curcumin disrupts the integrity of the viral in, uh, envelope this very envelope which actually secures it towards from the immune system and it in this effect it reduces the in, in effect uh, the effect of the uh, influenza virus so in some way by disrupting this integrity of this membrane it actually breaks the cycle of influenza virus spreading from cell to cell now apart from reducing the infectivity of the virus by destroying the viral envelope, as I mentioned, curcumin also performs a very important task of producing pro-inflammatory cytokine. This is related to its IL inhibitory activity. One of the reasons, one of the reasons to, excuse me, to all participants, please, Mute your audio, please. Thank you so much. Um, so one, one of the reasons uh, often cited for the curcumin's broad spectrum anti-inflammatory activity is because of its direct inhibition of NF-kappa B signaling pathway. I can say in short is NF-kappa B is actually the master regulator for inflammation. So curcumin's broad spectrum activity against viruses, inflammation, which is caused by the virus or the cytokine syndrome, uh, uh, storm syndrome, is because of its activity on this uh, NF-kappa B. So basically it helps to inhibit or slow down the inflammation of pathways, which is also part of your viral infection. Now, this, uh, this particular uh, study, which, is, which was published in 2007, actually cites the inhibitory activity of curcumin on NF-kappa B, which is responsible for the downregulation of the pro-inflammatory cytokines. And it basically lists out major cytokines or major molecules in your immune system which cause the inflammation. So here you have TNF-alpha, which is tumor necrosis factor. Interleukin has a whole family. A bunch of them in interleukin 1, 2, 6, 8, 12. 6 is more uh, related with uh, the current situation we are facing. And it also supports the immune system by inhibiting the TLR, toll like receptors. Now, toll like receptors are also part of the uh, uh, you know, immune system. They are basically located on the macrophages, which are part of your immune cells. And then this helps to identify the specific molecules on the microbes. However, what happens here is, if you have a lasting activation of the TLR or toll-like receptor, it, it is also detriment. So it, it is also one of the causes why your immune system becomes hyperactive. Now let's move into the uh, next uh, 
ingredient, which is known as king of bitter. This king of bitter is actually not the bitter gourd, but it is what you call as calme or endographis panuculata. In traditional medicinal system, for its it is used for its blood purifying properties. It has got a very good antipyretic activity. Well, it helps to reduce fever and also a good detoxicant. So it's a it's, it's one of the ingredients which is often found in detoxifiers, which people use in herbs. It's a very good anti-inflammatory. It's also known for its hepatoprotective activity in traditional as well as modern supplements. The main active are present in its aerial parts, which are known as a lactone kind of compound called endographolites which is responsible for many, most of these activities which I mentioned. Now, one of the key activities why we are discussing this uh, plant here in this particular uh, connotation is, is its antiviral activity through its interleukin-6 inhibitory action. So since interleukin-6 has a pro-inflammatory nature, endographolites also shows the reduction in inflammation a number of studies after oral administration. So in some way, uh, because it knocks down the IL-6, which is a pro-inflammatory uh, molecule, it helps to reduce the inflammation, which could be one of the after effects of your viral infection. Now, one of the interesting studies which have been done is on a virus which is prevalent in the Indian uh, subcontinent, which is called chicken. Now, chikungunya is actually a mosquito-borne alpha virus. It's a very different from the coronavirus, but it has emerged in uh, countries like Africa, Southeast Asian countries, where the mosquito uh, is still an uh, uh, existing problem. Chikungunya is also an enveloped virus, just as I mentioned about the uh, earlier viruses, which also have the en uh, envelope around. So it's in a way it's uh, able to hide its in the immune system uh, while between the host cells. Now, chikungunya spreads through the mosquito bites, and infected patients may develop symptoms in three to seven days. Uh, clinical symptoms are similar to dengue virus or dengue fever, and they include sudden febrile illness, high temperature, edema, gastrointestinal complaints. Well, this infection is not fatal, uh, but increased involvement of neurological system as well as recurrent infections have caused long-term impact on the quality of life. Now, endographis has been known uh, to benefit in this area. It has been able, by two different pathways, uh, it has been able to uh, uh, reduce the symptoms of uh, chikungunya virus and has been considered as a possible target for antiviral activity against the influenza virus also. In fact, the further effects of this endographlide on anaf kappa B, which is also something we spoke in uh, turmeric, has, is also a possibility how it can help to contain the cytokine syndrome, which, uh, which is a condition in the viral infection. Next, uh, we'll take up this black cumin seed. Black cumin seed is often found in this kitchen uh, for flavoring. Uh, it's very native to Asian culture, Mediterranean, as well as in African region. Uh, there are uh, very few areas of health where black cumin cannot provide benefits. So it's, it has enormous amount of benefits. In fact, otherwise it's also known as a remedy for everything other than death. So black cumin seed, uh, and its health benefits you can find in almost every areas of life. I mean, the wisdom of the seed is known for centuries, and perhaps worth mentioning that this its seeds were discovered in ancient Egyptian culture, uh, where the seeds where its seeds have been also used in Chinese as well as Indian medicinal system. In Arabian culture, it is known as best seed. Now, the research on black cumin seed oil is focusing on these ancient users and continuously validating uh, the application uh, which were done in, in, in folklore medicine. Uh, black cumin seed oil contains some very interesting compounds including thymoquinone, hydroquinone, hydrogenine, as well as 
uh, it has a very rich uh, fatty acid profile. Uh, these compounds have varied activities, which are responsible for its broad spectrum activity, as I mentioned. Uh, Nigella sativa or black seed has been studied for antiviral activity as well as for its anti-inflammatory activity, which is one of the reasons why we have included this uh, nature's gift, I would say, in this presentation. Thymoquinone is actually the main active of black cumin seed oil. It has been studied for its IL-6 inhibitory activity. At the same time, it also enhances the survivability and the activity of the T cells, which include the C8, D8 T cells involved in fighting the viruses. Now, just to give uh, an idea, T cells are part of our immune system, and they play important role in defense against the virus and the bacterial pathogen. So once it recognizes an antigen, or antigen is actually basically a protein uh, in, uh, on the virus. Once it recognizes the antigen on the virus, it becomes activated. One of the way it kills the virus is by releasing the cytotoxic granules, which can break the protein in the cells, stop the production of the viral proteins. It's important here to understand that this release of cytotoxic granule occurs in the direction of the target cells. So in some way, it helps to avoid the collateral damage to the healthy tissues surrounding the infected uh, cells. So the use, if you see these molecules, these phytochemicals, they actually elicit positive response from your immune system. So instead of creating an overactive immune system, which actually we see uh, can, can be detrimental to health, these molecules can actually give up a, a positive immune response to fight the pathogens. Acumin variety of viruses. Studies on the avian influenza, or better known as H9N2 virus, shows that black, black seed exerts anti-influenza virus activity. In case of acute hepatitis virus uh, C, uh, the studies have shown the recovery of almost 15 to 45 uh, percent infections. In fact, one of the combination study which was conducted with another species of coronavirus, uh, which was uh, which was found in 2014, it shows that prior treatment uh, with herbs like black seed, Anthemis hyalina, uh, and citrus sinensis, which is your uh, lemon, uh, can actually reduce the virus load, which indicates the pre-treatment interfered with the virus replication. There are varieties of uh, or more different modes of pathways which can actually help to reduce the viral load in the system. Now, it brings to our next ingredient, which really requires no introduction. That is your olibacil uh, or tulsi. Tulsi is an integral part of the households in India. It's grown in small parts within the courtyard or your kitchen garden. Interestingly, the health benefits of tulsi are enormous which can actually make another webinar to discuss. Tulsi or osimum leaves are rich uh, source for polyphenols like leutolin, eugenol, apigenin, carnosic acids. These polyphenols uh, provide a very good antioxidant activity. Poly polyphenols like carnosic acids are known to provide sustained antioxidant benefits, which are known, which are associated with the osimum extracts. Tulsi has been found to protect the organs and tissues against stressors which arise from our lifestyle. So you can always see Tulsi as a part of uh, teas to uh, calm down uh, stress or release the stress. In addition to the various health benefits of Tulsi, it, it also has shown the antiviral activity with multiple mechanisms of action. One of the key active in Tulsi is which is known for its antiviral activity is eugenol. It is present in uh, tulsi leaves. Eugenol is known to have not only potent IL-6, anti-IL-6 activity, which is advantageous for inhibiting the cytokine overtaking immune system, or what we earlier mentioned as cytokine storm syndrome. It also affects 
the uh, it does not actually affect the activity of CD4 and CD8 T cells. As I mentioned just a little back, the T cell activity in towards the pathogen uh, uh, is is important. And it's a positive chain of your of, of the immune system. So eugenol actually not only reduces the inflammatory effect of IL-6, but actually improves, or rather say, helps the T cells to, to, to take care of the pathogens. So in some way, it is again, eliciting the positive effect on the immune system. Now, a good example of this antiviral activity was observed in a study on the bird flu, or H9N2 influenza virus. In this study, it was noticed that the crude extracts of Tulsi not only show IL-6 specific inhibitory activity, but at the same time, it can interfere with the viral replication, as well as cause both specific as well as non-specific interference with the viral replication. So, as as I mentioned, some of these or many of these uh, herbs they have multiple pathways with which they affect the uh, the virus replication growth or its infection. Moving to the next product is chlorogenic acid. Now, this polyphenolic acid is very well known in, uh, in something which you per perhaps have taken daily, the, the coffee bean. The coffee, actually when you take the unroasted coffee, the, which is called the green coffee, chlorogenic acid is well known in that. The content of chlorogenic acid effectively reduces the time uh, of roasting, which is performed for the commercial coffee. The green coffee beans uh, extracts have shown to have thermogenic activity. But beyond this antioxidant action, chlorogenic acid is also known for its anti-inflammatory activity, uh, its cardiovascular benefits, as well as its antiviral activity. Uh, Initial studies have shown that chlorogenic acid can be effective against the respiratory viruses like uh, H1N1 and H3N2 virus, as well as hepatitis B. Chlorogenic acid has shown its activity against the IL-6 and TNF activity. This is one of the reasons why we selected this particular uh, ingredient or this particular phytochemical in this presentation. Because both these activities are important, considering their potential role in causing the cytokine storm. Again, if I'll just remind you the cytokine syndrome is part of a cycle where the virus has already been printing and your immune system uh, becomes hyperactive. And in, in that hyperactivity, it starts causing more, uh, 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 more destruction of the of the tissue than to the uh, virus itself. And chlorogenic acid in, in this particular case has been observed that it helps to reduce the IL-6 expression as well as it can help to reduce the damage to the lung tissue and the severity of the influenza virus. Now let's take uh, another, uh, let's look into another very interesting natural products and perhaps well known in the Western world, uh, resveratrol, which is obtained from the red grapes and has been part of diet in one form or the another. Now, the active molecule in this case, uh, uh, in this case has been studied for more for its anti-aging activity rather than anything else. And that is resveratrol. So resveratrol is part uh, of the grape seeds. Uh, it's a stilbenoid compound, polyphenol. Stilbenoid compounds are, are, are very stable in nature. Uh, this kind of uh, uh, polyphenols are stable and they have a very good uh, antioxidant activity. Uh, resveratrol is also very well known for the phenomenon of, uh, phenomena of uh, French paradox. Uh, French paradox is a catchphrase which was first used in maybe 1980s. Uh, towards the epidemiological observation that despite high saturated fat intake in the French region, people living there had a low cardiovascular incidences. So this idea was born that something in their, uh, something in their diet had a protective effect 
uh, which was uh, which was uh, reducing their cardiovascular risk, and this effect resonated with the activity of resveratrol. It has enormous health benefits, including antioxidant activity, anti-inflammatory. It has a very good neuroprotective activity, as well as its antiviral uh, action. Uh, however, it suffers from a disadvantage that it re rapidly transforms in the gut. Some of these uh, natural products, they do uh, have a similar situation, but uh, what happens is once they transform, it only reaches into a very minuscule amount into your tissue. So its benefit is rather reduced because of its very nature. But fortunately, our scientists and have found a solution to reduce this transformation and how you can actually get a, a, a therapeutic benefit out of the dosage. Now, studies of, uh, on resveratrol have shown its uh, antiviral activity against several viruses which infect both human as well as animals. And uh, this, uh, this uh, particular uh, uh, component, uh, the reason why we have chosen again here that it has also a very good IL-6 activity, which has been demonstrated in syncytial virus, which is a viral infection which happens in small children. Uh, it's basically upper respiratory tract infection. Several studies have been published on resveratrol, which, uh, which have shown its IL-6 inhibitory activity, as well as how it can help to interfere with the viral protein production or the life cycle of virus. Now, let's move from the herbs into what else we need for a proper functioning of the body. And I'll take two representative uh, micronutrients for the body, which have well-known effect on the immune function. Now it is well recognized that nutritional status of the host or human can lead, can be a leading role, play a leading role in the defense against the infectious diseases. Many studies have shown that nutritionally deficient human are more susceptible to a wide variety of infections due to impaired immune response. But it, the, the situation is actually much more complex. Why? Because an immune, impaired immune response also is resulting from the immune deficiency can also increase the virulence of the pathogen. So the third point which I mentioned here is that micronutrient deficiency can make a, a benign or mildly pathogenic virus to become more virulent in deficient host under oxidative stress. So if the health of a person is not up to the mark, even the small or benign viruses can actually also become uh, a disease causing or affect your health in a negative way. Let's take the first uh, uh, micronutrient, that is your zinc. Zinc is one of the most important micronutrient when it comes to the proper immune function. While its role uh, in human health is quite well evident. It is a fact that zinc is deficient in a population with a global uh, prevalence of deficiency ranging from 17 to 20%. So almost 17 to 20% of population globally is deficient in zinc. And zinc has become uh, part of the supplementation to help uh, overcome this situation. Zinc can play an important role in maintaining both innate as well as acquired uh, antiviral response. And zinc is also uh, important for proper functioning of antiviral components of our immune system. Because zinc is an integral component of many uh, viral enzymes, proteases, polymerases. These are responsible for inhibiting uh, viral replication and dissemination. This slide represents the antiviral mechanism commonly known for the zinc. As, as you can see, the antiviral activity uh, can be effective against host of viral families like coronavirus, uh, DNA-dependent uh, viruses, encephalo, encephalo uh, myocarditis virus, foot and mouth disease causing viruses, hepatitis C virus, HIV, uh, HPV or human papilloma virus, human rhinovirus, and host of other viruses. And this is a very common 
antiviral mechanism of uh, zinc, which I've been mentioning. Then we move to uh, my last example of this viral antiviral nutrients, is selenium. Selenium is particularly important uh, because it's an integral part of your body's own antioxidant system and is responsible to manage oxidative stress in the body. Uh, selenium is not present in body in the free form, but it's actually, in fact, is part of enzyme systems like glut glutathione peroxidase, uh, thioredoxin reductase. Uh, selenium is not only integral part of the antioxidant system, but also plays an important role in proliferation, differentiation, and proper functioning of, uh, of uh, immune system or immune cells. Uh, it is also ob observed that uh, selenium deficiency increases the vulnerability of host towards pathogens. And as a first line of defense, selenium provides an essential arsenal for the cytokines to take over the pathogens. So uh, selenium basically uh, helps to, uh, to provide you the antioxidant uh, system, your internal antioxidant system, but also is important for your immune system to actually function properly. Now, as we learned in last few slides, that there are several mechanisms of action, which include IL-6 inhibition, inhibition of viral uh, replication, disruption of the viral coats, modulating the pro-inflammatory processes to reduce the damage to the host cells, uh, managing cytokine syndrome, um, cytokine uh, storm syndrome. All these mechanisms can be effective and even more effective uh, and have like synergistic effect uh, when you include in uh, supplementation. So in, in, in other words, selection of uh, in ingredients to support the antiviral activity as well as antioxidant activity or improving the antioxidant status, uh, helping to reduce the inflammation by taking compounds which are anti-inflammatory. All these things can play an important role. So thus what we should be looking is at, at a synergistic combination of uh, more than one of these ingredients so that they can work together in synergy to help to overcome uh, the viral infections, improve your immunity against catching such viruses, and helping your body to stay resistant to such infections. So before I end my presentation, I'll show you some of these few combinations, uh, which uh, you see they contain both uh, herbs as well as uh, herbal mineral complexes for supporting healthy body function. This is one of the immune active capsules, which contains uh, our C3 reduct, which is uh, a new form of curcumin, white in color. Endographis, which we have discussed, Resonox is actually a brand of uh, resveratrol. Zinc, uh, I, earlier I mentioned zinc and selenium. An important part of zinc and selenium supplementation is which form you are taking, because in their salt or uh, inorganic form, they are not well received by the body. So you may be taking a zinc supplement, but in a, in a wrong form of it, you may not absorb in your body. And perhaps it limits its benefits. But when it's taken in the organic uh, zinc or organic selenium form, uh, where it is chelated with organic components like uh, amino acids or uh, ascorbates, it becomes much more effective. Uh, this is uh, uh, another product called Immune Health from Sinutra range of products, uh, which contains the very components which we discussed, uh, turmeric extract, uh, Amblica officinalis, or Indian gooseberry extract, which is also very well known for its uh, immune function. Uh, it also has got minerals like selenium in its organic form. And overall, uh, benefits actually are more uh, improvised by adding the black pepper extract or bioprint, which improves the bioavailability of these nutrients. This is how you increase the absorption or let's say letting your active molecules reach without to your target uh, uh, 
uh, cells without getting transformed. We in fact created the whole range of uh, wellness product, which is the, uh, which takes care of a majority of uh, health uh, product uh, health requirements at different stages of life. Now I'll be happy to take some questions uh, from the audience. Yes, uh, th this is Dr. Patel. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Pandey, for that scientific presentation on herbal products botanical extracts, phytonutrients, vitamins, and minerals. You, you know, Dr. Pandey, typical allopathic practitioner in the Western world, don't promote vitamins, herbal products, or nutraceutical products. But now what I see uh, from the patients who have been discharged from the COVID-19 infection, or while they are in the hospital, they are giving them vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, and, and many other uh, vitamins and minerals. So I think this talk, uh, you talked about zinc and selenium, uh, I think is an eye opener for many, practitioner, many practitioners in this country and Western world. And I think we all need to consider scientific uh, based uh, promotion to this kind of product. So thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. So we'll open up this uh, uh, for question and answers. I'm gonna unmute everyone and uh, we'll... Uh, with the questions. Uh, Dr. Pandey, this is uh, Dr. Thomas Abraham. I'm actually coming through the telephone because uh, my connection uh, through the video did not go through. It's still connecting. Anyway, it's an excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, can you give a little, I know you had given a lot of choices of uh, various uh, supplements and uh, vitamins and others. Can you give to uh, our people uh, some uh, daily supplement? I know you, you your company in, uh, have uh, some many supplements, but on a daily basis, what uh, minimum one should take on a regular basis? Well, um, it's it's uh, a difficult question to answer because every age has its own requirements. Uh, uh, but there are common uh, common ailments or rather say common requirements in our daily lifestyle, which we have. Uh, immune system in, in this time is important. And it's, I think, uh, prudent to add uh, uh, ingredients like zinc, uh, selenium. Uh, turmeric is a very good ingredient. When it comes to the immune response, because you are, you are, you are targeting the... Uh, the the master regulator for inflammation. It's it's something which one uh, one should be taking uh, you know on on a daily basis. And in fact, I would say uh, it's it's effect uh, in in a population which is actually uh, you know using turmeric or curcumin in daily basis. It's very relevant. I mean, if you see the Indian uh, uh, diaspora, we have less amount of colon cancers. Uh, than the Western world, and one of the reasons is because curcumin or turmeric, in other words, is is a is is a step is a part of our staple diet. So what happens here is that it helps to prevent these pro-inflammatory pro uh, molecules developing in a colon because the diet, the Western diet, which is prevalent, uh, contains a lot of pro-carcinogenic components, especially when people take uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, grilled food where the protein burns and chars and you know it, it goes in your in your food these these incidences are much higher in 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 the population which is not uh, which is not uh, yet uh, you know uh, taking this these uh, phytonutrients on a daily basis but in 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 if you compare the western world towards the what we have in in uh, in india you'll find the rate of colon cancer particularly is very less compared to uh, compared to the western one and one of the reason i i uh, i i think is basically because of uh, is the fact of the health benefits which we get from the curcumin so yes these are some of the actives vitamin c is another uh, 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 product which you should be taking for the seasonal symptoms improving your immune health uh, more than anything else, good nutrition uh, is also important. 
uh, we take too much of uh, products which are processed food. Unfortunately, it's a part of our lifestyle. It's a part of our diet where uh, time is also you know important. So we depend upon uh, frozen foods and you know uh, snacks and so on. But the fact is. Uh, Many of these nutrients or micronutrients like zinc, they are present in the food, but because we are processing them so much, it becomes almost uh, an irony that the very reason why you are eating breakfast to get more uh, uh, more fiber in your food, you actually have to, the, the, the companies who pro provide you the cereals now actually have to add those fibers back into the system. So you'll find Kellogg's coming and saying uh, high fiber, uh, you know, cereals. The cereal was always supposed to carry it just because it's processed too much. You, you end up actually having to add up those things. So your, your food intake is also very important for your health. Uh, it's just not the supplements, but the food intake itself, the quality, the, the kind of food which you are taking, uh, it's also very relevant to your health. So Dr. Pandey, there are a few questions on the chat message here on Zoom. Uh, and the first question is, where can we get these supplements? Well, uh, supplements you can get from uh, you know, a variety of locations. But in, in case of uh, the ones which I have mentioned, uh, uh, this website, AFI Supplements, uh, you can write to me and I can, I can suggest from, uh, from there. Uh, you can get uh, these supplements online as well as uh, in the stores okay. and, and Amazon as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another question. How are you integrating into mainstream medicine? All these well, products. Mainstream medicine. Uh, when you, when you mention as a, uh, as allopathic medicine. Yes. It's, the difference between the mainstream medication as well as supplements is that supplements are uh, here to supplement your diet. They are here to help you to, uh, to retain or regain the nutrients which were supposed to be your part of your food. See, the food was supposed to provide all these ingredients which I mentioned, majority of them. Uh, you, you're, you're taking zinc because you're deficient in zinc. You're taking vitamin B the injections because you are deficient in B. It's not that you're not eating good food. You are eating a very healthy diet. But majority of Indians, uh, or uh, let's say majority of Americans, they lack these vitamins. Uh, they lack vitamin D. They lack vitamin, uh, you know, Bs and so on. The, basically, the purpose of supplementation is to provide those lacking nutrients back into your system. Now, integrating the mainstream medicine is because mainstream medication has a different fundamentals. They are they treat the symptoms, and often they don't treat the the underlying uh, region, uh, reasons for that. So here, uh, if you're taking uh, a mainstream medication, talk to your doctors and uh, and and ask them uh, about what nutrients they can take, and often um, and not you will find. Uh, now the doctors, the Western medication uh, practitioners do have understanding that people would be taking uh, supplements. We, we, we found ourselves that a uh, lot of doctors do realize, and I, I, I get calls you know, from these doctors often who have not yet been very accustomed to some supplementation. They also realize that a lot of people who come to them for variety of uh, function, they may be taking supplements, especially curcumin, bioprint combination. These are very commonly taken, you know, supplements for joint health, for lipid health, for cognitive health, and you know, so on and so forth. So, people, especially in the Western medication system, allopathic, they also are interested to know uh, what kind of uh, uh, effects or what kind of process or mechanism they they are working, and uh, it it helps them to integrate. Uh, you know, uh, uh, usually it's a good uh, interaction between the Eastern medication, uh, you know, uh, users as well as the Western to interact and understand how these uh, uh, medications can work. In fact, I do understand in uh, Arizona the, uh, where we have a college of uh, uh, naturopathy, they are also integrating these uh, 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 education system into the mainstream to understand the upcoming doctors to understand 
how relevant is uh, these supplementation can be for people who are taking uh, you know medication so they don't work against each other these medications don't work they can actually supplement okay. sometimes they can uh, they can uh, you know uh, supplement or be an adjuvant to your uh, your uh, medication which you are taking yes another few questions on on chat as well uh, a question about turmeric powder how should it be taken with warm milk or water or it should be warmed up with ghee and then have it to get the nutrients absorbed in body well uh, turmeric is interesting um, you turmeric first of all is not uh, uh, you know it's not the same thing as curcumin so when you are looking at therapeutic uh, you know information you will realize that turmeric actually contains only very small amount of curcumin the yellow color part which you you know you see in the turmeric itself is actually only 3 to 5% of by weight so if you are taking let's say a teaspoonful you are actually having a minuscule amount of uh, active compound so it's unless you are being taking it for daily for a long time uh, its effect are still very limited now when you take it as a supplementation uh, putting it in the milk or putting it in uh, you know uh, different variety uh, you know uh, coffees or thing may not provide you all the therapeutic benefits so when you are taking coffee and you add up a little bit of turmeric it's always good for health but when you are looking uh, curcumin as a supplement then what you be looking what you should be looking at is the form of supplement you are taking so we came up with a dispersible form of curcumin which now you can actually add up in uh, beverages but earlier than that to get the sound amount of curcumin which is like 500 milligram dosage which should be taken to uh, you know to get all its health benefits you it's it's put in to take a, a, a form which is uh, providing you that amount so whether you add up in your milk or whether you add up into your tea uh, the question is how much amount goes into your body uh, so the 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 supplementation when you're looking you should be looking at the quantity which you are taking not in that form because dissolving something in water is not uh, usually more effective than uh, what it it's naturally present in the solid form very good point uh, another question came uh, from a chat message which food items contain zinc and selenium and you did not mention about garlic well garlic is actually uh, another component which contains some very interesting uh, micronutrients uh, and selenium is actually can be incorporated into the garlic uh, and we actually have done it without uh, in a hydroponically grown garlics means we take the garlics we because it has a uh, uh, several peptides which actually can uh, uh, bind or chelate the uh, selenium so we actually created uh, garlic which is enriched in selenium uh, among the nutrients i can i can uh, i can suggest uh, you know taking green leafy vegetables is a very good uh, source for these uh, thing when you taking these minerals you often find they because they are uh, enriched in the soil so certain roots which we take they are always enriched in uh, in these kind of nutrients which are present in the soil mm -hmm. very good <clears throat> so uh, there is a comment here uh, from lata mangipuri as a state representative in new hampshire i'm trying to bring about legislation to support this integrative medicine how can your clinical studies support legislative effort well it's uh, it's something which uh, is related from uh, on the legislative side uh, i i i can only see or uh, i can only interact with her and see what kind of uh, clinical studies are required um, uh, to integrate the you know, supplement i think one of the key things which we should be looking at is how we can have supplements uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh. Mm -mm. of our box has got to be wet wiped down and everything you can't just use the no i wash stuff when before i bring go ahead okay so what i was saying is uh, it'll be interesting uh, it will be actually uh, helpful 
for people or for 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 the uh, legislation to see if if we can have supplements uh basic vitamins can go into the uh into category which can be actually uh looked after the insurance right now people who take the supplements they actually cannot claim it in their insurance so that is something which would be interesting to see if if this integration of uh, uh, supplements can be done at least some supplements which are well supported by the clinical studies so as uh, Ms. Lata has mentioned we have plenty of clinical studies on curcumin in fact we published a book recently on clinical studies uh, on curcumin right now perhaps there are close to 100 uh, studies which have been published in peer-reviewed journals uh, on variety of subjects it's not just you know inflammation but how uh, other things have been you know affected by uh, curcumin so definitely uh, there is plenty of studies which come into uh, you know uh, in in uh, case of curcumin which can be useful uh, uh, to you know get some support from the legislation to include them into uh, into a way by which people who perhaps cannot afford uh, or, or would like to have uh, supplements can actually claim it with their insurance. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Pandey. Uh, we do have the contact information, uh, email, as well as the phone number from Lata. So I'll share that with you. Uh, there is another comment came. Uh, are we recording this presentation? Yes, we'll be recording this presentation and we will be providing it to Chairman uh, Thomas Abraham, and he can share it with uh, the group. Can I ask a question, please? Yes. One question. Yes. Uh, this is Rita Bhattija from Long Island, New York, and I have a question and I have a comment. So if you may allow uh, to, you know, make a comment, like the question came that which is the food which is uh, excellent source of selenium? and that is a Brazil nut. So people can have two to three Brazil nuts per day. And as far as the zinc is concerned, which is uh, coming from the pumpkin seeds, so they can incorporate one to two tablespoon of pumpkin seeds per day. Uh, also, when you mention about the physicians, uh, there are a lot of physicians uh, who now have started incorporating the complementary medicine, as we say, the complementary therapies. We cannot say only, uh, and that will be that they are looking for the uh, specialty who have a functional medicine. So, because when they go to the regular physicians, they don't have that much time, and which is understood because they have to see 60 to 70 patients, so you know, they have to move fast. And they don't have time to just go over the entire, you know, the uh, intake of the patients to recommend them. So I think there was a question came up that which will be the uh, one of the supplements to be taken. So I normally tell my patients that just as of, you know, for the sake, just take the good multivitamin where you will find the B complexes in the methylated form. So I think maybe you can mention to them some next time that what is the methylated form versus the any B vitamin because you brought up a very good point that all the vitamins are not the same. Same thing with the turmeric. So it is very important for our community to understand. So I really appreciate that. And I think you did not mention about vitamin D specifically, so that they need to know that why even the higher dosages, they are, even though it is considered the fat soluble. So if you can mention that to the community, that why even they can take 5,000 IU and you can bring up up to the optimal level up to 70 to 75 so only 30 is not really considered good enough so if you can shed some light on that thank you definitely i'll take that note and uh, make sure that these information are you know shared uh, perhaps yes. we have another webinar uh, to talk about the nutritional uh, intake yeah. uh, necessary for yeah. Your yeah. Yeah, I happen to be the registered dietitian nutritionist. <laughs> and yes, this is my message to all the physicians that please partner 
with the registered dietitians, nutritionists, because they have done so much work and they do have an insight. And there was also a question came on this uh, lady from the New Hampshire, Lata. Actually, there is an Institute of Functional Medicine. They are doing a lot in the legislative arena. There's a White House conference. And I'm also very heavily involved uh, with the Academy of the Nutrition and Dietetics, where we have this Dietitians in Integrative and Functional Medicine Practice Group. There are 5,500 dietitians, and we are doing a lot with the legislation. It is, uh, I mean, some people may like Trump, some people may not like Trump. That's besides the point politically. But in his uh, opening remark, he mentioned the Toby's name, Toby is the CEO of the Cleveland Clinic. And Cleveland Clinic is the only clinic in the world where they had the first functional medicine, um, you know, the program. And Dr. Mark Hyman is the chairman, actually, of the functional uh, medicine. And he also now has started the lobbying with the Washington, D.C., like Dr. James Gordon and some of them. So there is a lot being done. Uh, and I'm sure that we will get something to it. So I appreciate your thoughts, but if you can mention about vitamin D to the community, so because why it is so important. This is Lata Mangipuri. I would like to ask a question to the, you know, from coming from a state legislative point of view, I have introduced a couple of uh, legislations in the last two terms. And I understand your, where you're coming from as a dietitian. And when we introduce a legislation, when I looked up for support from uh, the integrative medicine, the term itself is very confusing. Functional medicine, alternative medicine, uh, integrative medicine, many different forms. And so when we are introducing a legislation, the questions comes up, what is it actually? So I have focused just on yoga, yoga therapy, and Ayurveda as one of the alternatives, and to just get the supportive uh, documents to convince my colleagues. It took a Herculean effort, and I couldn't, because it's so wide. So it would be very helpful, uh, Dr. Pandey, your presentation, if I could get very specific and quote what uh, medication or supplements help with what kind of thing, especially with the COVID-19 situation where we are building, trying to shift the attention from not just symptom treatment, but also uh, building the community's immunity. And, you know, that is a very key opportunity we have. If we can do a coordinated effort, it would really help. So okay, let me give you a little bit of uh, my insight on this matter because this is something which is perhaps uh, important for uh, the whole community to understand as well as uh, we coming from different areas, uh, you know, uh, dietitians, uh, herbalists and legislation. So giving you just a little background of uh, how these products are regulated is important. Uh, every country has a regulatory body which basically looks into how these products, uh, whether they are drugs, food, or medication, they are, uh, uh, are put in the market and what you can say, what you cannot say. Um, the supplements or what, the, uh, what you have mentioned, uh, perhaps Dr. Lata also has mentioned, as uh, functional medicine, or uh, alternative medicine or complementary medicine. These are terms which uh, in, in FDA, which is the governing body or regulating body, uh, consider it as a part of food, which is called your dietary supplements. Dietary supplements, and for, uh, for uh, all of you to understand, and perhaps in case of legislation, it's important to understand that they, uh, they regulate the health supplements under the uh, under the regulation of DSHA, that is the Dietary Supplement Health Education Act. This act was passed in 1994, October 15, and in, it allows the food, uh, it allows the dietary supplements or these functional food which you mentioned to be part of the food, and they are allowed to make something structural and functional claims. Uh, these special type of 
claims are not the same thing as uh, as uh, therapeutic claims. So we, uh, when we mention about uh, uh, supplements, a complementary medication, we never give, uh, we never claim uh, any uh, disease. Uh, we don't claim uh, curing or mitigating any disease uh, as a part of uh, regulation. That doesn't mean that the product is not sufficient to provide that benefit, but it is the regulations which are uh, which keep us uh, bound to, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, to to comply to them. I think at at, at legislative level, what should be done to make Ayurveda as a part of the system. If you see um, a Canadian uh, system, Canadian system is one of the first to actually recognize the traditional Chinese medication. Now, you may find it interesting, but we still are looking to get Ayurveda uh, recognized by them as a part of supplements. I think the same effort should have been done here as well. Because exactly. at any level, at any state level, when you're looking to, uh, to get these supplements, or, or, or let's say Ayurveda or yoga uh, associated, you know, science to work on the federal side as well. So yeah. FDA has to uh, be roped in into the system, um, not just the industry, to see if if uh, if a billion people are getting benefits, then why not so many million people who can actually take? Yeah. And um, and really, in absence of that. You're not getting the uh, all the benefits, of, uh, you know, the Ayurveda in in that context. So, yes, I, I definitely agree. This 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 can be something which one can look into it. But as of now, supplements. Uh, when you're looking for, uh, uh, you know, uh, in this particular stream, I'm, I'll I'll not go beyond what we have been discussing on the on the uh, on this topic. Uh, when you look for uh, uh, supplements. You may not see people mentioning COVID-19 on the page. This is not something which we or anyone should be doing. Uh, we, we make claims which are allowed by supplement uh, regulations, which we comply and adhere to. Uh, we also make presentations to the government uh, to, to improve the level of uh, claims which can be allowed and be relevant to people who actually have the studio. This is another thing which, uh, which you have to look. I mean, these, these things are something for perhaps a round table conference would be uh, more, uh, you know, a uh, better uh, platform to discuss. But there are certain things which we, uh, which we have to look into uh, before uh, going uh, into, you know, into that area. Thank you so much, Dr. Pandey. Uh, we are uh, almost at the end of our time, almost 12.30. Uh, I have you. one question, Mr. Banerjee here. Go ahead, sir. I have a question about coffee. You, we all drink coffee. And thank you, by the way, Dr. Pandey, for an excellent presentation. I'm from Canada, Mr. Banerjee here. Is which any particular kind of coffee that would be beneficial to get the benefits that can help us to fight and build immunity towards the virus. Well, actually, uh, Dr. Banerjee, interestingly, Mr. There, Banerjee, yes, yeah, Mr. Banerjee, uh, yes. Mr. Banerjee, uh, this particular ingredient is actually in the green coffee, and when you take the coffee as you know, staple dye, it's actually a roasted coffee, so you may not get it as a coffee, but you may actually have to take it as a supplement. Oh, I see. So, so the regular coffee will not be as effective as what not, I'm hearing you say. Plus, I would not suggest uh, to take too much of coffee based on the caffeine content. But you, uh, in Canada, you have the uh, uh, little more regulated system than US. So you have this uh, NHP, natural health products. And uh, if you look into the NHP, you will find the green coffee beans or uh, regulated uh, you know, uh, health benefits, which which are acceptable in the uh, in the uh, in the Kenyan uh, system, so you may need a supplement of coffee itself for this benefit. 
I appreciate that. And also just to add to your comment about Canada and the regulation, it was the province of BC known as British Columbia about 10 years ago or five years ago that allowed integrated medicine, in particular Chinese medicine, to be uh, provided through OHIP. OHIP is our, our uh, it's, it is, it is the, the funding for health because health is covered here. So it is to the province of British Columbia. Uh, if anybody has a question or needs any help, I do know parliamentarians in British Columbia, or we can study to see how did BC get this approved, where integrated medicine has been allowed to be one of the mainline medicines that are actually funded and covered by the province of British Columbia. Thank you, Mr. Banerjee. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anurag Pandey, Sabinsa Corporation, for that wonderful presentation today. On behalf of Gopio uh, Health Council, Gopio Central Jersey, and on behalf of our chairman, Dr. Thomas Abraham, I would like to thank you all for joining uh, for this wonderful presentation. And Dr. Pandey, uh, any uh, departing comments for the for the group? Well, I would, uh, uh, you know, lastly, I would say that, you know, in difficult times, uh, let's stay together. Uh, social distancing is, you know, something which uh, we have been practicing. And I think you are actually seeing the effects of it. Uh, hopefully, we will come through uh, this problem. And uh, hopefully, you know, uh, we, we see the, the light at the, you know, the yeah. end of the tunnel soon. Thank you, everyone, for your time and uh, your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Stay healthy.